everyone else in line. See y'all later. Now, my name is Silas. I'm going to be your guide today. And this is our driver, Luke. Everyone say, hey, Luke. Hey, Luke. Luke says, stop distracting him. No, I'm just kidding. Now, before we get any further, I want to introduce you to our MC of the evening, to host of the Tonight Show, Jimmy Fallon. Hi, I'm Jimmy Fallon. Welcome aboard the world famous studio tour. I know what you're thinking. Why the tux? Well, we're celebrating our 60th anniversary. That's right, 60 years of glitz, glamour, and our own great white shark. As we celebrate our diamond anniversary today, we pay tribute to Universal's past and take you behind the scenes to discover why this studio tour is world famous. So whether this is your first visit or your 60th, get ready for fun, excitement, and an experience like no other. up on our right, we're going to start traveling down what we call the Universal Timeline, and that's because you're going to be able to see just a few of some of the thousands of films produced here at Universal Studios over the years. We opened up our doors on March 15, 1915, thanks to a man named Carl Lemley, who had a dream of creating a city dedicated to fostering a community of artists. And that's exactly what we are today. We come equipped with our own zip code, sheriff's stuff station, laundromat, and fire department. And you'll see that fire department later on down the hill. On March 15th, Carl Lemley invited the public into the studio to watch silent movies being made. And guests could walk from set to set and marvel at the new technology involved in filmmaking. But with the invention of sound and the need for quiet on the set, the original walking tour ended. Then, in 1960s, under the leadership of company chairman Lou Wasserman and executives Al Dorskin and Jay Stein, the idea of reviving a tour of the studio returned when the Grey Line bus tours, which originated in Hollywood, made a stop at our gates. And then, on July 15th, 1964, the first of our red and white candy stripe glamour trams took 67 passengers on a two-hour tour of the Universal lot, and the world-famous studio tour was born. We started with two drivers, two guides, and one ticket seller working out of a trailer on Lancashire Boulevard. From there, the studio tour expanded with fantastic one-of-a-kind Hollywood elements like the rock slide and the burning house, which were in this area of the back lot, in, in the lot, back lot, we get there later, of the 1970s and 80s. Over to our right, that fire station I was telling you all about, that was where the burning house was originally standing. Very fitting that we replaced it with our fire station. Now, right now, we're traveling into our front lot. Our studio is made up of two parts, front lot and the back lot. The front lot is home to the majority of our 36 sound stages as well as all of our sound and editing facilities. This place is really unique because it's where we can do the entire filmmaking process from start to finish, pre-production to post-production. Coming up behind me, you're going to see sound stage 12. That's our oldest and largest sound stage in the to about 30,000 square feet. Come with some of your favorite large sets in history like Dracula's Castle, Frankenstein's Lab, Scarface's Mansion, and the town of Whoville. Today you're on board one of our 60th anniversary glamour trams. It's one of our super trams, but dressed up in a throwback style. This red and white candy stripe was originally created by Harper Goff, a well-known Hollywood art director and set designer who worked on movies like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory for Paramount, and was known for his fantastical designs. Then in 1963, 1983, we upgraded to super trams, allowing us to carry more guests and experience more thrills. In 2000, we added onboard video, turning the tram into a movie theater on wheels and in the past five years, we have gone electric. And on your screen, that was all of the scenes, a lot, many of the scenes filmed in Soundstage 12. Now right now, we're headed into our front lot. Over to your right is our Super Nintendo World, home to Mario and Luigi, the stars of our biggest film of 2023, the Super Mario Bros. film. It's also where the studio tour guests once had a chance to explore facets of Hollywood not accessible to the public prior to 1964. In the 1960s and 70s, they could go over here to visit the dressing room of Lucille Ball. They could also visit the office of Edith Head, award-winning costume designer as well. It was also home to our special effects stage. Now over to our left, you'll see some of our sound stages. Sound stage seven, that's where we filmed the iconic shower scene in Psycho. You know, Alfred Hitchcock was not just instrumental in the horror genre, but filmmaking as a whole. I mean, if you think of that shower scene, he taught us that our imagination is far scarier than anything you could see on the screen because Anthony Perkins, who played Norman, wasn't even in California when they filmed that. He was actually in New York working on a play. 
sound stages have you used for uh, recent pictures like Universal's 11th Best Picture Oscar winner Oppenheimer in the third season of the Peacock series Bel Air? And to tell us more, here's our next 60th anniversary guest, the stars of Bel Air, Jabari Banks and Ollie Charlton. Park behind and entering the front lot where real Hollywood magic is made. Now, well, inside the sound stages that surrounds us, we can create any kind of environment that you can imagine. For the past 60 years, studio tour visitors have driven right by these buildings, and inside these walls, the sets from your favorite TV shows and movies have transported audiences anywhere the imagination can take you. Even to a palatial mansion in Bel Air. When we film Bel Air, we love coming out of the sound stages and seeing the trams filled with excited guests as they drive by. So, uh, keep an eye out. You never know who or what you'll see on the studio tour. Our television history goes back almost as far as our film history, beginning with our broadcast of the 1939 New York World's Fair, and we've been making shows ever since. Classics that have made these sound stages their homes include The Jeffersons of One Day at a Time, newer shows are Killing It, and sorry, Greg Robinson, and based on a true story starring Kaylee Cuoco. But before these productions make it onto your screen, they first have to go through something called the pre-production process, and that's everything that happens before the camera starts rolling. So you've got your budgeting, location scouting, screen writing, and casting, all of that and more that happens here on our front lot. After pre-production, we head into filming, followed by post-production, distribution, and release. Now, post-production can take a really long time. An example of that is our newest show, or one of the newest shows. We have Ted. It's a prequel to the Ted films. And speaking of Ted, look to your left. There's Ted himself. Everyone say, hey, Ted. You know, he's a little shy today. It's him. It's not you. But we released that on January 11th of this year. His brand new show. We started filming in August of 2022. So that just shows you how long the post-production process can take. And post-production is everything from adding computer-generated imagery, CGI elements, to sound design and color correcting. Over to the left, you're going to see some of our famous production bungalows. This is where the pre-production process happens. Over the years, we've been home to many famous production companies. We used to have Monkey Pop Productions over here from Jordan Peele, brought you No Bus and Get Out. Currently, we have Mark Platt's production company, who brought you La La Land, and they're about to bring you Wicked. We used to have Dwayne Johnson's production company, Seven Bucks Productions, whose name derives from the fact when he first came to Hollywood, he had a total of seven bucks to his name. And nowadays, we have the De Laurentiis Company, who brought the Hannibal franchise to your small screens, which is very fitting. And speaking of four directors to our left, 5195, former office of Alfred Hitchcock. You can still see a silhouette on the outside of the building. Now coming up here, sound stage 25 and 26. This front half looks a little different than the sound stage I showed you earlier. It's because it's home to production offices and fitting rooms. But just behind it is where we film Lopez versus Lopez, starring George Lopez and his real life daughter, Maya Lopez, and our newest show, St. Dennis Medical. Now, roughly 80 to 90 percent of filmmaking is done within our sound stages because it's such a flexible and controlled environment. But what happens when a script calls for a set too large to fit inside of those sound stages? We head to our metropolitan set, where the world is literally just around. We're about to cross the imaginary boundary onto the back lot, but we have exterior set for many outdoor scenes. Over the last 60 years, studio tour guests have seen these locations turned into big cities, quiet suburbs, even that guy's hometown. Yeah, that guy. For countless movies and TV shows. This is Universal's Metro Sets. Although it takes up only four acres of land, we can turn it into almost any city in the world. And the benefits about filming here versus on location in a real city saves us time, money, and we get full creative control. Coming up on our right, you're going to see our Brownstone Street. You might remember it from Bruce Almighty, but it's also the road that Marty McFly sped down to reach 88 miles per hour to get back to the future. We are on our way to Courthouse Square, and to tell you more about Courthouse Square, here's star Leah Thompson and one of the producers, writers, and creators of Back to the Future, Bob Gale. Welcome to the Courthouse Square. These sets were used to create Hill Valley in the Back to the Future films. And they represented multiple time periods, 1985, 1955, in the far, far distant future, 2015. To this day, this is one of the most popular sets on the Universal Studio Tour. We had a lot of fun making those films here on the lawn. I wonder what it'd be like to go back to those days. Only we had a time machine. Hey, everybody. I think we can get this tram up to 88 miles per hour? I think so. Let's try it. Now, this is Courthouse Square, everybody, and there is Doc Brown. Everybody
everyone would say, hey, Doc. Hey, Doc. And that clock tower is where Dark harnessed the bolt of lightning that sent Marty McFly back to the future. It works! The time experiment works! the space-time continuum. Let's head on with our tour. See you later, Doc. Now, the building courthouse might look a little different from how you remember it, and that's because it's currently covered by a facade. A facade is a structure that can only be filmed from the front and sides. It's everything that the camera sees. If you want to go inside a set and film the exterior of it, that's called a practical set, and we have our fair share of both here on the lot. Now, Back to the Future was originally going to be filmed in Petaluma, California. We realized it would cost us too much money to do what the script called for, go from 1980. And we can come here up a facade, basically a fake wall, and it transforms the entire surroundings. Now, Courthouse Square still has many facades that were built in the 1940s. The rest of our metro sets are considerably newer, redesigned, and rebuilt from 2008. And before that, this area was home to a studio tour classic. And here's one of the stars of Universal's 2005 version of King Kong, Jack Black, to tell you all about it. And self-action. Did you know? Metro sets were once the home of Hollywood's biggest star. Right here is where the original studio tour of King Kong attraction resided from 1986 until 2008. He stood 30 feet tall and weighed in at 13,000 pounds. Over the years, millions of guests got to meet King Kong face to face as he shook the tram so close he could feel his hot banana. That's my last line, and then the tram moves on to the next thing. We really do, Jack Black, we do, but not too far off because we are headed out of the concrete jungle, but into the jungles of Skull Island. Here's Peter Jackson to tell you more. It's the original King Kong, but Don't put them on yet, but just have them in your hand because we're about to return to the sky. Quick safety reminder, please remain seated at all times. Supervise all children. Hold on tightly to all those belongings. Hold your hands and feet inside the vehicle at all times. Remember to use that red corner in case of an emergency. The amount of phones that have been lost here at Skull Island unparalleled. So hold on tight because you will either never see them again. I wish I was kidding, or you won't be able to retrieve them until the very end of the day. The universal trend. visitors a little sneak peek at some of the wildlife that's going on. In a sense, this is like a mini sequel, um, a mini continuation. We are just taking the, the Kong and Skull Island and the dinosaurs that we established in our feature film. And this is uh, yet another day, another incident on Skull Island.
for King Kong 360 3D. Wasn't that the coolest thing y'all have seen today? Yeah. Now that epic battle was brought to you on some of the world's largest 3D screens, measuring at 40 feet tall and 180 feet wide. It was brought to you by the minds of Peter Jackson and the team over at Weta Effects. Weta Effects has won a total of seven Academy Awards and worked on films such as Avatar The Way of Water, The Lord of the Rings Trilogy, Planet of the Apes, and of course, King Kong. But now, coming up, y'all, get your cameras ready, because once we head down this hill and back up again, we're going to see a unique part of the attraction that has not been around since when we first opened our doors. We got a good view of the Metropolitan Center. Now, these buildings are roughly 50 feet tall, but on camera they look a lot larger, and that's because of forced perspective. The higher the buildings go up, the physically smaller we make these windows get. Same thing with the base house building, if you're standing at the hotel towers above you. But, again, look out to your right for the runner right train. Right here on our right are the runaway train and the collapsing bridge. The collapsing bridge was a mechanical effect that the trams used to cross, and the hydraulic support beams would split and the bridge would seem to collapse. The runaway train was originally located in our western set. It used to hurtle towards the tram and come to a screeching halt. Both are retired effects made for the Studio Tour 15 years ago. Now, as we traveled through Skull Island, you may have noticed that we lost the fifth car of our tram. Thank you for checking. It's not there, is it? Y'all were just going to trust me on that? <laughs> Uh, no, it's gone. It disappeared into the depths of the jungle. But what's really cool about that, not for the fifth car, but for us, is that makes us a picture car. And a picture car is any vehicle on the screen. Doesn't have to be a car, doesn't have to turn on, doesn't have to move. And coming up on our left are just a few of some of the hundreds of picture cars we have here on the lot. First one is the 1932 Ford Deuce Coupe from American Graffiti. Now we also have our Ferrari from Magnum PI, but that does not have a Ferrari engine in it. It actually has a Volkswagen engine. That saved us a lot of money. We have cars from Back to the Future, bringing us to the future's the year of 2015. It's the way on my flying car. My favorite flying car for you Harry Potter fans is the small blue one coming up, the Ford Anglia. Yes. For that film, they made 17 and a half models of that car. The reason they made half a model was because they couldn't fit the film equipment inside the car, so they cut it in half to get the perfect close-up shot of Harry and Ron. And we have the gyrosphere. You'll notice the sphere is gone. We add that in post-production. Otherwise, you'd see the glare of the camera on it while we film. And we have what looks like a tank, but it's not. That's called the Bradley Fighting Vehicle. It's made out of pressed plywood and then later painted in order to make it look like it's rusting metal. That saved us a lot of time, money, and made it a lot easier to drag around set because of how well it Uh-oh. And I guess now I should be preparing you to enter a little island off the coast of Ghost of Welcome. Dinosaurs are in our DNA here at Universal, and they've been a part of the tour for three decades. I'm excited to tell you that the new era of the franchise begins on July 2nd, 2025 with Jurassic World 4. Just in time for our 60th anniversary, and as we enter the Jurassic Forest, here's Chris Pratt to tell you about the location. So for many years, this part of the studio tour was the Greens Department where we keep real plants and trees that could be used as set dressings for TV shows and movies. Nowadays, it's where you can see many of the set pieces used in the Jurassic films, including some plants and trees, except these are Just like the dinosaurs were out. At least, I don't think the dinosaurs were Actually, they might be too good. Oh my goodness, y'all, I had no idea that that was going to happen. Oh. 
It's okay, they're only venomous on Thursdays though, so we are safe. <laughs> Is today Thursday? <laughs> oh, it better be a good 60th anniversary then. Uh -oh. Now, we just passed by our mobile lab from Jurassic Park. You might remember it from when it was dangling off the side of a cliff during the film, but I'll let you in on a secret that was not a cliff at all. See on your screen right now, we didn't have to leave our front lot to film that. In fact, we didn't even leave our parking lot. We filmed it on our parking structure next to Soundstage 14. And we combined CGI with real and fake plants to bring it to life. Now, another really important effect with productions is weather. Jurassic Park, the hurricane, prevented everyone from leaving the island and furthered the plot. And we met the T-Rex, the thunder, and the lightning emphasized the mood. But what do we do if we can't? You know, the weather we need isn't in the forecast for the upcoming week. In that case, we make our own. Welcome to Old Mexico. We are now visiting another classic attraction on the back lot. And to tell you more, is today's show host, co-host, and weather anchor, Al Roker. Time for my favorite part of the tour, weather. When it comes to film and TV, it is truly a special effect. In fact, to demonstrate how weather effects are created, we debuted our first major attraction here on the studio tour way back in 1968. Straight up out of our sprinkler heads arched down in order to mimic the real flow of rain and the pull of gravity. There was rumored that for singing in the rain, they put milk powder in the droplets to make it look more defined. That is not true. We use the lighting technique where we light the actor from the front, light the rain from the back. Technical film term called backlighting. Uh, but this is getting a te intense, right? We should probably stop it. I think so. Uh, Luke, this isn't working. Luke says we're on our own. Oh my gosh. Oh no. Um, uh oh. Uh, oh no. Oh no. Flash flood! Yo, that has never happened before, right? That was crazy. You might remember it from Big Fat Liar. And that's over 6,000 gallons of water that goes down the hill and gets recycled back up again for the attraction over and over. And it's the oldest attraction we have on the studio tour. The reason we added it was because, you know, we're an active working film studio. And we were worried at first that people would come for tours and there wouldn't be filming every single day that they were here. So we added the flash flood so that at least every day we knew there would be some sort of excitement. Now right now we're traveling down what we call Six Points. It's our western set. It gets its name because off of this one main road there are six distinctly different side streets. Each one connects with its own town, equipped with its own bar, sheriff's office, and war. Now these sets were essential during our early days of filmmaking because we were in the silent era of film. So we could theoretically film six productions at one time here, and that is exactly what we did. During our first year of being open, we released over 200 westerns thanks to Six Points. And our founder, Carl Lenley, even invited the public to watch filmmaking take place, like I told you all earlier. But it wasn't just great for the public, but it was great for the actors as well, because the public would cheer for the good guy, boo the bad guy, and it amplified their performances. Nowadays, we can't have audience participation in the same way. Talkies made their way on the cinema, lights pick up the slightest noise. If we have a tram going through a hot set, the words quiet tone flash up on our screens, we have to remain completely silent. But there is an exception to when we do allow audience participation, and that's when it's in the form of a live studio audience. And in that case, we head across the lake to sound stages 30 through 33, home of the voice. Now this lake I'm talking to you all about, we call it Park Lake, but it's also known as the Hollywood Ocean. Here in 1974, we added the parting of the Red Sea to the studio tour. It was inspired by the classic film, The Ten Commandments, a paramount picture, and the star of the movie, Charlton Heston, made an appearance to part the waters for our guests. been exploding water mines, torpedoes, and prop submarines as part of the action in the lake, including Reacher from the Black Lagoon. 2024 marks the 70th anniversary of the 3D classic Reacher from the Black Lagoon film, which filmed here in our Hollywood ocean. It's part of our legacy of horror and monster movies that stretches from Dracula in 1931 to the upcoming Dark Universe at Universal Epic Universe, opening next year in Orlando. 
Now, a lot of our monster movies were filmed in Little Europe. Over the years, it's been transformed into Italy, Paris, Wales, Transylvania. If you're a fan of The Princess Diaries, it was the fictional country of Genovia. In Princess Diaries 2, the royal... Yeah, you're a fan. Me too. Me too. Royal engagement. But most recently, and now most famously, it has been known as the afterlife. Welcome to the good place. so successful in the role of Frankenstein's monster, he went on to star many other monster films, with Bela Lugosi often appearing as his second. He also went on to win a Grammy Award for voicing the narrator in the animated version of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So that just goes to show y'all, there are no small parts, only small actors. So y'all go chase those dreams. Quick safety reminder, studio is private property. If at any time you drop your phone or just can't wait to use the restroom, reach up, grab that right cord, but remain seated. Please no smoking of any kind during the tour. And next up, y'all, we are currently at one of our sound stages. In front of us is sound stage 50. You may know that last year we closed the earthquake attraction that stood on this part of the lot for decades. We made way for this new, unrivaled, state-of-the-art soundstage that is already in high demand. In fact, it is in such high demand that there's filming going on inside right now. And you can tell by the wigwag light up ahead to our right, to the right of the, you'll see it, it's green. We have wigwag lights on all the stages. That lets us know if something's filming in there, and that way we can put the words quiet zone on our screen. So if you're ever on the tour and you see guides frequently turning their heads around, they're always checking for wigwag lights so that they can stay silent. But we have made an arrangement with production to travel through these elephant doors to see what happens on the inside of the stage. <laughs> As we get ready to enter, be prepared. The set has just been decorated for a highly anticipated production. It's Hollywood's only two-level soundstage. And you'll be able to check out this detail so soon.
will celebrate its 50th anniversary this year. It was released on November 15th, 1974 to star Charlton Heston, Richard Roundtree, and Ava Gardner and filmed in our sound stages on the Metro sets and the Flash Flood. Now we are at our halfway mark officially, so again, I know I just said it, but quick safety spiel. Please remain seated at all times, keep your arms and feet inside the view, hold the red cord in case of an emergency. Now we talked about westerns, classic monsters. What about the monster from the first ever summer blockbuster? Anyone have any guesses as to what that is? Jaws. Jaws. Y'all know, y'all know, you're pros. So let's go for a swim over at Amity Island. And now y'all might be thinking, hey Silas, isn't there a shark problem there? Uh, no, I fixed it. Okay, we are completely, you don't seem to trust me. Get ready, it's going to be perfect, no sharks whatsoever. Welcome to Amity Island. <laughs> it's also Cabin Cove. <laughs> Jaws theme would start playing, y'all. That's when you know we shouldn't be here, but so far so good. Beautiful day here at Amity. I hope I spoke too soon. Uh oh. We're gonna get to the bigger tram. You know, it's a good thing my best friend George isn't working today. He's the diver at Universal. If he was here right now, this would not be good. Oh my, oh no, there's George. George, get out of the water!
Steven Spielberg was one of the executive producers on the film, so it's fitting that we put them there as we travel up Steven Spielberg Drive. But this section of Steven Spielberg Drive is known as Wilderness Road, because if you look around to, you will see nothing, and that is on purpose. We filmed a scene for Bird Box right here, and whereas other production companies might go to the actual wilderness for filming, that means that they're going to be confined to using the set amount of production trucks that they brought with them for the day. Versus if we come here, we have everything we need at the bottom of the hill in our front lot. Our entire wardrobe, props, makeup, everything we need, which saves us time, money, and it goes to show you Universal really utilizes every inch of land that we have here, even if it seems like there's nothing around. Coming up on our right, you're going to see a massive blue screen. We use this for areas that are that have eight sets that are too big to fit inside of our sound stages, so we use it for Jurassic World, Top Gun Maverick, Monkey all of which provide digital and practical effects. In front of this massive blue screen is a basin that holds 2.7 million gallons of water. It takes three full days to fill it up. It's where we filmed the iconic plane crash scene in Sully. On our screens, this entire scene was filmed directly to our right, where we also uh, built full-scale pirate ships, massive mermaid lagoons for Pirates of the Caribbean. And on your screens, you see we digitally inserted the Hudson River shoreline onto that blue backdrop. And it looks a little warped on your screens, and that's how we were able to make it seem like the area was significantly bigger than it was. Now speaking of plane crashes, as we turn this corner, we're going to be coming up on another one, our War of the World sense. And the airplane to your right is a real 747 commercial airplane. It cost $60,000, and it was shipped here on flatbed truck for $200,000. So that just goes to show you, always check that shipping and handling. Okay, that's where they get you. Over to your left, you can see we're rebuilding some of our houses. These were originally based off a real town, um, a suburb in New Jersey. And we don't take houses from someplace else for this set and then tear them down. And we don't build them up and destroy them. We built them to look redestroyed. Coming up on our right, we're going to see a set that has been a highlight since the original 1964 studio tour, and that is the home of Norman Bates from Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. And if you look in the top left-hand window, once we get to the front of the house, you can even see um, Norma Bates in the rocking chair. Just beyond it, if you keep an eye out on your right, you're going to see our official scale replica of LA's most iconic landmark, the Hollywood sign. While we're celebrating our 60th, the Hollywood sign has been commemorating its centennial year. Our version of the sign is a scale model, and the letters on your right are 10 feet tall, while the original letters stand at 45 feet tall, just as we turn to the screen. For the first few decades of the studio tour, one of our hallmarks was a visit to the Props Plaza, where guests disembark from once-in-a-lifetime photos and to interact with characters, vehicles, and props from their favorite productions. Well, guess what? Just for our 60th anniversary, we brought that opportunity back. But now remember, folks, this is a limited stop. When you are ready to continue your tour, simply follow the signs. You'll be boarding a different tram with a brand new studio guide, so remember to gather all of your belongings right now. Make sure to pick up those 3D glasses as well, because you're going to need them when we resume the tour. And as you disembark, please walk toward the front of the tram and have fun, y'all. See y'all soon. Watch your arms and legs.
earthquake, right? Wasn't that incredible? Uh, yeah, when, when my son went through the first time, it, it did not work. Uh, but we went again, and it did. Second time's the charm. It was pretty cool, right? What was your favorite part? The, um, the truck, or the train coming, or the water? Yeah, me too. Me too. set used in the film. We just tore it down on its original filming location and rebuilt it back up here. And we opened it up to the public the same day it was released from the theaters. But this was terrifying, so let's get out of here fast and furiously and head into Sullivan's Truck Repair, which was originally called the Doomed Glacier Expedition, better known as the Ice Tunnel. The Ice Tunnel was featured in an episode of the Six Million Dollar Man starring Lee Majors with Andre the Giant and Big the train could climb to an imaginary elevation of 12,000 feet, and the only way back to the theme park was through the ice tunnel, where the slightest sound could trigger an avalanche. And it always did. It would cause the walls to spin, and guess to took along with the Hollywood special effects. But nowadays, it's fast and furious. So quick safety reminder, please remain seated at all times. We are to life inside the vehicle. Supervise all children and blue red board.
right, party's over. You know how long I took to iron this shirt, man? I'm, I'm not. You're under arrest right now. Ladies, just back up a little bit. Got it. It's like that. First of all, I don't work for you. Oh, really? Well, tell me, Roman, who do you work for? We don't work for nobody. Cop, I suggest you clear out of here, otherwise we can't get into your city. Guarantee my safety? I'm the one holding the gun. Yeah, but mine's a whole lot bigger than yours. Um, escort this novice out. Let's go, Cookie Puss! That ugly suit on, man. It's cheap. Somebody out there really pissed off Shaw. It's gonna get ugly fast. Yeah, don't worry. Lucky for you, our whole family will protect you. Are you kidding me, Roman? You didn't shut off your phone, bro? I gotta call you back. I'm just, I'm gonna know this. See what I'm talking about? Call you back. It was on vibrate. Sean traced us. I just can't hold him forever. Letty, Roman, we're up. <sighs> Trying to move that vehicle. It's about to get real interesting. The Mona Lisa's all warmed up right next door. celebrating 60 years of the studio tour with us. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the studio ambassadors, drivers, and studio guides throughout our history who have helped make the studio tour world famous. From our first tour guide to drivers to the hundreds of team members who support the tour today. To our pass holders, thank you for being with us today. If you're not a game pass holder, you can head up to the box office where you can find out how to update today's tickets. You may use pass, you can come back again and again. Please make sure you download the Universal Studios Hollywood app and confirm our closing time. Great time to rise in attraction. And 
show times from Austin World and get details on visiting Super Nintendo World. To purchase any of the MVP, Universal Films, or shows from Team Home Tour, visit UPAT.com or ask today at one of our retail stores. On behalf of myself and Luke, round of applause for Luke, everybody, for keeping us safe today. And on behalf of everyone at Universal Studios Hollywood, we hope you've enjoyed this exclusive, this behind the scenes Hollywood experience. And you enjoy the rest of your evening here at Universal Studios Hollywood. And as they say in Hollywood, that is a wrap. Thank y'all so much for joining us today. Hi, I'm David Allen Greer. And I'm Wendy. Please remain seated. The Studio Two Ambassadors will be by to open up these gates for us shortly. Watch your arms and legs while exiting the vehicle. Thank y'all so much. You are the best group I have ever met. It's true. Actual medicine to jump you. That would make for a pretty good Let's laugh at some of the funniest moments from Universal Comedy history. Boom.